So the presentation today is about generative AI, uh, the potential and the pitfalls. It was actually a title that was generated by Chat, Chat GPT uh, when I requested the speakers to uh, to give me a, a good title and a good abstract. It was, uh, of course, something that they used uh, as an assistant so that uh, they could come up very quickly within seconds, actually, with the title and the abstract. Of course, you have to do the selection of the best one yourself and maybe look at the content and see if it's it's fully uh, adequate, but uh, it can save a lot of time. And ChatGPT was, of course, dropped on the world on the 30th of November. And a lot of people said, ooh, and oh, and what is this? And, and it was amazing, it was mind blowing. And some said, uh, okay, this is the start of artificial general intelligence. Probably not, but uh, it's, a, it's a step in the right direction. It's a game changer. It's definitely a productivity booster. And that's what we're going to talk about today uh, with the two speakers, Sam and Michiel, uh, Sam Hendricks and Michiel van den Driesse, who are also the co-founders of the Raccoons Group, specialists in AI and uh, automation, and uh, our hosts for today. Uh, of course, you may have seen Michiel uh, recently on national television or on Nash, heard him on national radio because he was a uh, very... Uh, Interviewed very a uh, lot, a lot of times, and uh, was also in the newspapers. But okay, the virtual room is yours. Explain us what generative AI is, what the different tools are, like ChatGPT, DALI2, etc., and what we can do with it. So the potential and the pitfalls. Floor is yours. All right. Thank you very much, Patrick, for uh, the introduction. So for the next 90 or uh, 85 minutes, we're going to do a real deep dive in generative AI. So we'll explain a little bit what it is. We'll show a lot of demos and, of course, answer a lot of questions. Now, before we get started, uh, let me start by introducing ourselves. Uh, Patrick already did it uh, very briefly. So as Patrick mentioned, we are both of the co-founders of Raccoons. We founded Raccoons a little over six years ago. What Raccoons is, I will elaborate a little bit on that in a couple of later slides. But first, I want to show the uh, agenda of today uh, to show you what we will cover. So. I won't turn this into a sales talk, absolutely not, but just to illustrate why we are giving this presentation about generative AI, I'm gonna show in two slides what Raccoons is. So we'll take a very um, high level introduction to generative AI. So what is it? What is its relationship to other uh, machine uh, AI terms like machine learning and so on? So how does it fit into this AI landscape? Then um, we've heard a lot about tools like ChatGPT. So the company OpenAI is behind this. So we'll elabor elaborate a little bit on that, especially the timeline, because that's some, an interesting thing to share. And then uh, the most fun part of today shows some cool use cases. So I think most of you probably will have seen ChatGPT. We'll show that, but a lot uh, of other tools as well in different domains from text to video to music and so on. Then we'll try to explain a little bit how you, you as a business, uh, as someone who works for a business, can use generative AI. We'll discuss the legal and the ethical part. And then very important, some limitations and considerations. Despite the fact that it's amazing technology and super fun to use, you have to take some limitations and considerations into account. And then we'll take a peek at the future, what it will bring for generative AI. And if general AI is lurking around the corner, we'll see that at the end of the presentation. So as promised, what is Raccoons? Very simply put, we're a team of over 60 passionate technology enthusiasts. And the passionate is a very important word in the sentence because working with technology such as AI, which is constantly changing, changing, you need to have a real passion for new technology. Now, we try to use this new technology and build digital products and digital platforms for our customers that uses this technology. Um, also, besides building uh, these platforms and solutions, we also help our customers to see how does this new technology fit into your organization. A lot of thought leadership, like what we're doing here and what Michiel did a couple of weeks ago uh, for many days on national television and the radio, and then also help our customers grow with uh, this technology and stuff we build. I won't go into too much detail. Uh, we build everything from uh, order processing platforms that leverages AI for customers such as TVH and Ravago. We build amazing virtual assistants for Acerta, and we even design and develop custom AI solution for space technology. If you want to learn more, we have a very uh, uh, descriptive website with a lot of content, a lot of use cases, and so on. Feel free to head over there after this presentation, of course, mm -hmm. and learn more about what we do. And if you want to hop in a 30 minute call to discuss something with us, we're also always available for that. And you can schedule that also via the website. Okay, up to you, Michiel. 
All right. So um, I, I think as Sam mentioned, AI is basically the glue that holds our company uh, raccoons together. And, and we use it a lot and we're, we're very excited about it. Um, so, so what we want to do now is give you a quick introduction to um, what we call generative AI. So, so what is it? First of all, I think um, we need to put it in a larger um, AI um, landscape. So if, if, if we talk about um, artificial intelligence, it's basically a set of technologies um, where computers can do uh, human-like things. As you can see here, it's, it's, it's multiple technologies. It's not one technology, it can be many things. For example, computer vision, predictive analytics, intelligent document processing, and so on. So um, when we're talking about generative AI, um, it's very important to mention that this is not here to replace regular AI. It's just um, a subsection of AI. And we believe uh, that other aspects of AI that are not generative AI are still equally important now and in the future. So it's they are still used as well, and they're not, not going anywhere. And maybe some, some people are, are already saw it here in this slide, but the, 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 the terms on the left, those are, are the stuff that we call regular AI. And the, the stuff on the right, this is generative AI. So you see, it's just a subset, just like all the other technologies in AI, in AI and all the other innovation, generative AI is, is, is pretty similar. And the techniques behind generative AI are pretty similar to the techniques um, that are used in regular uh, AI systems or regular AI methodologies. And um, at a very high level, these are things that are based on stuff like machine learning and deep neural networks. So, so we're not going to, do, going to go into too much detail about this technical part, um, but know that this is not a replacement for AI. It's not something that is uh, next to AI or, or something new to AI. It's, it's basically just a subset of the general thing that we call artificial intelligence. Um, what's also very important to note um, is that Generative AI um, is, is not new. Uh, we're already into a few years of research and a few years in technology landscape is actually quite a while, especially in artificial intelligence. Um, and, and we've seen that there, are all, have, that there, were, there, there were already um, some systems. So in the, we're going to talk about the history of open AI in a few moments. And we see that these technologies, these models behind, for example, JetGPT, they're not very new, three, four years ago, the, the first versions of, of, the, uh, of these models were already introduced. But why is the hype now? Because there are um, a lot of tools that are made available to the general public, to a broader audience. And, and before you needed a lot of technical knowledge to, to use those generative AI systems. And now you don't need those uh, technical knowledge anymore. People who have already talked to ChatGPT, it's very easy. You just sign in, you create an account, you sign in, and you can just use it. It's a very simple web-based conversational interface, and you can talk to it, and you don't need any technical knowledge anymore. So this, and the same thing for other systems that we're going to um, show Show today is that it's just much more easy to use than it was a few years ago. It's getting out of the research phase and more into the um, yeah to the, in the application phase where we see it's it's being embedded into a, a, applications that everyone can use. Um, now there is a second reason why uh, the hype is now here, and um, and that's basically because it's better than ever now, and that's because. Uh, or thanks to three relatively new techniques for generative AI. And I want to um, discuss um, those three techniques, generative adversarial networks, transformer networks, and diffusion networks. I, I want to discuss them um, on a very uh, general level, level. So I don't want to, to get too technical, but know that if you hear something about guns or transformers or diffusion models, know that these are the systems that that uh, that power or that fuel those new generative AI uh, systems. So let's just start with the guns. Um, this is the first technique. How does this work? Well, basically, this is a simple um, uh, sketch of how this works. And um, basically, two AI models are trained. Uh, the two AI models here are um, in the red color and the blue color. There is a discriminator, and the discriminator has a very simple job. It tries to recognize AI-generated, so fake 
content, it tries to recognize it from real content. So it tries to distinct um, um, uh, generated content, uh, fake content and real content. And the generator tries to generate random content from random inputs. Now what the generator is actually trying to do is it's, it's trying to fool the discriminator. So the generator needs to make uh, fake content that is so good that the discriminator cannot distinguish, distinguish between the two of them. Now, the output of the discriminator, so whether the fact of it, the generator fooled it or not, that is fed back to the generator. So the generator knows if it fooled the discriminator and it learns from this input. So in, in, the, in the beginning, it will just create very noisy, not, not very good content, but it will get better and better over time. And the discriminator will also get better and better over time until the generator can yeah, generate very, very good fake content. And that's that's our, our goal. And that is the first thing how uh, AI um, uh, or generative AI systems uh, have worked. And this, this, this was a model that was very popular uh, a few years ago. Um, those image style transfer demos that you've seen like three years ago, those those times, or around those times, um, they used guns. Um, style transfer demos were, for example, if you have an image from today, but in the style of Picasso. That's that's an example. That was uh, There were a lot of very, uh, very cool demos there, and they used all guns or generative adversarial networks. Okay, so again, it's very high level. It's a little bit technical. Don't want to go, go too technical today, but know that this is basically how this works. Second model is a very important model in a generative AI, and it's a model that we call a transformer. There's a lot of yeah, mathematical content. You don't need to pay a lot of attention to this. Um, this is basically a, a representation of a transformer. What you need to remember is that it has a encoder decoder architecture. So the left part is the encoder, the right part is the decoder. And the input uh, from a user is encoded by the encoder in a let's say a computer readable format and now the second thing that's very special about a transformer is that it has a so-called self-attention part to automatically learn which words are more relevant for example in a sentence than others and you have to think of, of, of a transformer or this self-attention part uh, as, as a detective so the, the, the transformer reads the sentence and it uses the context from the surrounding words to solve the meaning of the sentence, just like a detective uses clues from a crime scene to solve a case. And a detective will always focus more on some clues and less on other clues. And that is basically what the transformer is doing. It's automatically focusing on some words to, yeah, uh, to, to get the meaning um, of the sentence and it basically gives more weight to certain words and that's what we see here in in the network there is a multi-head attention and a mass multi-head attention that's basically uh, what this is doing um, what's also very important about a, about a transformer is that it can read the input sentence in parallel so not word by word uh, which uh, we have uh, in, the, in the past recurring neural networks uh, did and the, the 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 idea here is that it can train much faster now the decoder is the right part and it uses all this information to decode the input to an output of arbitrary length, for example, again, a sentence. And one of the main use cases for these transformer networks is neural machine translation. So if we look at Google Translate, this is basically what happens. I give it a sentence, it's encoded, it does all the attention stuff and it's decoded into a sentence of, of another language. That's basically how it works, but also, and you could guess it, Chat GPT, uh, which, which has the GPT model behind it, it also uses um, a transformer. So the T in GPT is basically transformer. Um, so this is a very, very important model in generative AI, especially in text. And the last thing that I wanted to show you is what we call a diffusion model, which has become very common in 2022. So it's, this is relatively new uh, because in 2021, OpenAI already released a paper called Diffusion Models Beat Guns or Generative Adversarial Networks on Image Synthesis. So what does this do with a diffusion model? Very simply explained, when training a diffusion model, when you feed it with training data, we're going to add noise to the training da data. And um, so noise basically means that it removes detail from the data, for example, from an image. And the model learns 
to remove this noise again and to add the detail again. So that's basically what the, what the model learns to do is it, it gets a fuzzy image and it, it removes the noise and makes it and, and it adds some detail. But if you train it a lot of times with a lot of data, what happens? then it can produce content from random noise. So you just feed it with random noise. You feed it basically with nothing, pure noise, as you can see here in the, in the, in the image, and it generates an image. So here you see the different steps that the fusion model is doing um, to generate, in this case, uh, an image of a landscape uh, with some mountains in the back and some clouds. But it starts from random noise, and the diffusion model removes the noise and removes the noise until we get the image again. So these are the three. We have guns, we have transformers, and we have diffusion models. And these are the three main models uh, nowadays used for generative AI. All right. So before we head over to the use cases, the tools and the platforms that are out there that uses uh, that use generative uh, AI, I would like uh, to very briefly cover the history of OpenAI. Why? Because all the tools that you've seen or heard about, uh, ChatGPT, Dolly, and so on, and probably the reason why you are here in this presentation, were researched, designed, and developed by OpenAI. Um, we'll cover these use cases like ChatGPT and Dolly later on, but I would like to start with a very brief introduction of OpenAI. So, OpenAI was founded back in 2015, the end of 2015. So it's uh, over six years ago that OpenAI uh, was uh, that OpenAI came to be, and it was uh, founded by really famous people like Elon Musk, uh, who needs no introduction. Uh, Sam Altman uh, was also responsible for Y Combinator and is currently still running the show at OpenAI. Peter Thiel, uh, one of the uh, leading Silicon Valley investors, and many others. So a lot of brave minds, uh, bright minds came, to, uh, came together and started and founded a research company with a very specific goal to create an open research company, as the name states, to develop artificial intelligence that benefits humanity. So that is quite the goal, of course, for a research center. And it took off in the beginning of 2016. Uh, Elon Musk, who was one of the leading uh, names, of course, in the, in the founding team, uh, left uh, the board in 2018 due to a conflict of interest. Tesla is also developing uh, their own AI, for example, the autopilot. And due to conflict of interest, Elon Musk left. And also around that time, uh, OpenAI probably started to notice that they were really onto something and they transitioned from like a non-profit organization to a kept for-profit organization. Fast forward to today, it's currently valued at uh, 29 billion. And while uh, we were making this slide specifically for this talk like a week ago, this is already almost outdated, but I will come back to that a little bit later. Now, I don't want to bore you with like a boring timeline, but it's very important to, to uh, showcase this because as Michiel already mentioned in the beginning, it's not that generative AI is something new that came to be at the 30th of November. No, it is a year, uh, a, a research of over many years that is now reaching the, the popular uh, the crowd uh, with popular uh, technology. So OpenAI was founded in 2015. And then in 2017, the first release of GPT. Yeah, so the, one of those transformers that Michiel described, GPT stands for Generative Pre-trained Model. Which uses um, transformer. transformer, sorry, <laughs> which was trained, <laughs> which was trained on a massive amount of data, and it was the first uh, transformer that they uh, released to the uh, to the public in a uh, research phase. Then later GPT two came, and then finally GPT three, which is still uh, an early version of what is used today. And then a little bit later, uh, the first version of Dolly, so the one that we see today and that we will show a little bit later is already Dolly uh, uh, 2, but Dolly 1 was released. And then in 2020, they, they started to notice that they were really onto something and they started researching the safety part, the ethical part and so on to finally in 2022 release GPT. Uh, ChatGPT and Dolly 2, which we will cover a little bit later today. It's also interesting to note that the GPT 2 is an open source language yeah. model, so you can you can you can download it, you can use it, you can alter it more on that later. Um, but GPT 3 is a lot better than GPT 2, and that is not open source; that is a paid model. So you see that they're still uh, do, mixing like the open in OpenAI with making it more close. They're still mixing it, and they're still finding this uh, where where they, where where they should go uh, with 
with this technology. But if you want to use a, 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 an, an already good, but not as good as GPT-3 language model, GPT-2 is, is, is a good candidate um, to, uh, to do that. Yeah. And then very important, and this is the slide I meant that was almost outdated because uh, Microsoft was already um, a good partner of OpenAI and back in 2019, they did a $1 billion investment that gave them a license to the underlying GPT-3 technology. So a little over two years ago, almost three years ago. And it allowed them to integrate uh, GPT into existing uh, services that Microsoft had. Now, since OpenAI really took off the last months, Sam Altman, who is running uh, OpenAI at the moment, was looking for a $10 billion investment uh, that would uh, uh, value it at $29 billion. And um, by now, since the beginning of this week, Microsoft confirmed that it did a multi-billion dollar, they didn't uh, disclose yet how much, but probably it would uh, is a $2 billion investment, into OpenAI. And now they are like, uh, they have like a, a full license for every open AI service that they can integrate into, for example, Azure. And so in the Azure uh, environment, developers can very easily incorporate these open AI services such as GPT, uh, DALI, and so on, but also into business tools that we use nowadays. So expect, for example, chat GPT or in some form that will enter Microsoft Word, for example, or generate easily generate uh, replies to your emails in Outlook. So this really makes Microsoft, uh, it really puts Microsoft at the frontier of incorporating these extremely powerful AI services into their current uh, proposition. Microsoft is also providing um, early or, 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 or exclusive access to OpenAI for their supercomputers or newer supercomputers in Azure to run all these um, algorithms that OpenAI is developing. So there's a very good collaboration between those uh, two companies, Microsoft and OpenAI. Yeah, and this really means that a generative AI will really take off from now. I think our minds were all blown in November and now uh, the train really left the station uh, with this partnership again. So let's head over to the fun part of this presentation and elaborate a little bit more about some interesting use cases. So what we did for you is we split up the uh, different use cases in a couple of domains because generative AI most of uh, most of you probably have seen ChatGPT, uh, which we can classify in the text domain of where generative AI performs well. But we also have other domains, images and videos, I think music, think coding and so on. So we'll cover some tools uh, uh, as well. So actually this part doesn't really need an introduction, but generative AI is, uh, performs really well in text. Everything from text generation, so given a certain prompt, it can output a specific text, think a news article, an email, a poem. Uh, it's National Poem Day, Michiel told me today. Um, but also text summarization, give him an entire book and give him a short summary that uh, uh, will give you the recap of the book. Or even just like ChatGPT, have real dialogue systems. But what better way than to show you ChatGPT? Probably a lot of you have already experimented with ChatGPT. But we just wanted to uh, show you, for, first of all, for those of you who've never experimented with it, but maybe show some stuff that you didn't uh, really know. So ChatGPT is based on GPT 3.5, uh, the model we discussed. It's accessible via a simple web interface. Everybody can create an account and go to it. Sometimes at the moment it is down. Uh, so it's a lot of people experimenting with it. And uh, uh, sometimes you need to wait before you get access. But it seems like we already have uh, access uh, directly. There is a pro version coming. I will elaborate a little bit more on that later on. But ChatGPT gives you the power to do a lot of stuff. So they give you some examples. It explains its capabilities, but also some limitations. So Michiel, maybe you can uh, start uh, by giving it a simple prompt to show you what is possible. Yes. So something that we, um, what we use uh, ChatGPT sometimes for is, for example, um, we have to give a good explanation about the metaverse, and, and we have to think how, how do we explain this about uh, to to someone who um, who has no idea what that might be, and how, how do we explain this, for example, in a presentation or something? And that's something that you can just ask ChatGPT, for example. Um, can you explain the metaverse to a metaverse to a 10 year old? Something like this. And let's see uh, 
what is coming out. And of course, uh, we know that these servers are sometimes, um, uh, yeah, they're, they're, there's a lot of load on them. And then it might happen that we don't get a response. Let's see if it works now. Normally, once you get a reply, you get like some type of priority and then the other responses come quite faster. But it seems like maybe we should start with a refresh and try it again or, oh, oh. no, okay. There it is. Patience is always the best. So, and now we get an explanation uh, about the metaverse like I'm a 10 year old. So it's a very um, easy way to explain this. And of course, we're not going to just copy paste this text, but it gives us, because we already know a little bit how we might explain the metaverse, yep. but it gives us some more inspiration. It gives us some, some other things that we can do, uh, some, some, some other stuff that we can use, some other sentences, words that we can use to explain this. For example, it's also context aware. So now we're talking about the metaverse. I can ask you, give me three use cases for Belgian businesses, but I'm quite lazy. I don't like to read. So in three bullet points. No. <laughs> and once it's up and running, uh, it still remembers that we were talking about the metaverse. And imagine that this would go instant. So if there is a lot of computing power behind this. There was a Twitter user who cal calculated the cost of running uh, ChatGPT. And um, th th they just uh, did some estimations about where it was run and 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 um, and how many requests there were and what um, hardware it it needed, and they estimated it to be around one hundred thousand dollars per day uh, that that it cost um, uh, OpenAI to run this. So this is also the reason if, if if they if they make it even more powerful, so it it would answer right away. It would cost them maybe in the millions per day. So uh, this is one of the reasons. Um, and here we get three bullets about how uh, Belgian businesses can, um, yeah, can leverage the metaverse and how they can use it, which is uh, it's, it's very interesting. Now, for example, um, we get now the three bullet points, but like Sam, Sam mentioned, we have uh, it, today is National Poem yep. Day. So let's say just a uh, metaverse poem. now write a poem about it. Good idea. Now we get a poem. The, the metaverse awaits a digital door, a gateway to a world forevermore, where Belgian businesses flourish this and thrive a in a virtual thing. space where the future comes alive. With virtual marketplaces selling far and wide Belgium's products and services always on the site, and so on and so on. So we get actually a very nice po poem uh, about um, about the metaverse from uh, from ChatGPT, which, which, is, which is quite nice. We, we, we can already... Uh, yeah, uh, uh, raise a question if this you if, if this computer is being creative and a a, a, a real po poet would say no this is not creative this, this hasn't felt my pain this hasn't felt the things i felt to create this poem but i I, I would say that this is some kind of very early yeah, creativity from a computer. And, and it's actually a, 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 a fairly good poem. And that's, that, that's what makes this uh, uh, technology very nice. Apparently, uh, someone mentioned that it was extremely good at writing haiku poems. I haven't tried it yet, but here, life on the go, turn it into a haiku. I don't know if we have any haiku poem experts here, but apparently it's uh, quite good in uh, uh, putting it into a haiku uh, structure. No haiku expert, but again, here, a metaverse uh, haiku. This is text. Maybe we can head over to the coding part a little bit as well, because um, the uh, chat GPT is also very capable of writing computer code. Why, you might wonder? Well, like I mentioned before, it's trained on massive amounts of data that is available uh, on the internet. What's on the internet a lot? code, computer code. And people asking questions about this code and people who are giving replies to those questions about this code, explaining code. And all of this information is fed into the underlying language model, which is GPT 3.5. Um, so it's a, it, it's a very nice addition to, to have it write code as well. Code is basically just text as well. So maybe have we, do we have a good example, something that uh, ChatGPT can Let's write? Imagine that you're writing Python. Uh, for those who are not technical, it is a programming language and you have to write a, a specific function or a specific, specific piece of code that uses Google Vision to classify an image. That's a... For I example, want to use for those of you who are Google aren't... Vision API to classify or, or to uh, detect which content is on an image, write for me the Python code. For those of you who are uh, who are non-developers, 
this isn't the most complex task in the world to do, but again, you would need to read documentation, find the exact syntax, uh, trial and error it a little bit. It would take some time to get it up and running. Now, again, it's a generative model. It, um, there, are, there is a possibility that there are some small mistakes in it, but this gives you an amazing head start on how to write this code. And especially uh, once it's back up and running and it will reply, if it writes you the code, and it's quite unclear for you. You can always ask, can you explain the code to me? Because I really don't understand it or ask to change it uh, and so on. So I really hope that OpenAI knows that we're giving a presentation and will give us priority on their network to do this. Maybe this is a good time to mention the pro version as well, because they're, they released a Google Forms where you could um, uh, subscribe and give information because they're planning on uh, launching a pro version. Uh, which would cost apparently $42, uh, and it would give you priority access and constant uh, uh, working machine uh, and so on. But I will show that a little bit uh, uh, later as well in the presentation. So here it's writing uh, the code. For those of you who are Python developers and work with Google Vision, for me, it seems that this is quite correct. Uh, if not, it will probably be small mistakes, but this is oh. load failed. Oh, it, oh. Was, it, it was doing so good, and then we got a load failed. Okay, okay, so that yeah. happens. Uh, maybe we can retry it, but it it was uh, oh, sorry, just uh, yeah. come on, I thought you were in Chrome. No, yes. We're gonna try it again, try it again. Yes, you saw ah. Ooh, now it's much faster. So you see, that's also random because now it's giving me a little bit different code, but it should, yeah, it's, uh, it's completely different, it should work as well here. Um, so here we have a, a, a nice piece of code that helps us, um, yeah write those kinds of functions uh, a little bit faster, which is which is very nice to have. We, we have here uh, a humanoid robot called Pepper, which is a 10-year-old robot with very bad documentation. We asked some stuff to, uh, to, um, to write some Python code for the Pepper robot to make it wave and say something, and it just spit out a code. And it's, it's even on Google, it's hard to find those codes. So that's, that's very, very nice about, uh, about, about these uh, language models. We can go much more into detail about ChatGPT, but we have some other tools to show you as well. So taking the time into account, we'll move on to the next one. But ChatGPT is super user friendly. Experiment with it, and um, where you, it's it's very easy to get some stuff out of it. But you really have to try. You really have to give it a lot of time to become a really good prompt engineer. Uh, so writing these inputs are called prompts. So prompt engineering is actually the art of writing good prompts that give you a good output. Just before this uh, presentation, I was browsing LinkedIn and I saw a post of someone who made it, uh, um, who created an Excel with all uh, of the companies that it would try to target. He was a sales guy and he had like a thousand contacts with different properties, and it had a, a plugin in his Excel that uses ChatGPT to write a cold email to them. But there were 1,000 unique cold emails, super personalized to them, that were generated by ChatGPT. So in like one hour, he had like 1,000 cold emails that were super personalized, and he sent them out, and he had a much more higher success rate. All super amazing stories that leverage the power of these uh, generative models. About the considerations, the limitations, ethical and legal part, we'll come to that a little bit later because, of course, also many questions around that will probably come. So as mentioned, um, ChatGPT, uh, some users reported that they would launch a pro version. So indeed, uh, ChatGPT or OpenAI, uh, they released a, a survey, as I mentioned, that would a little bit uh, ask the market, how much would you want to pay for this and so on. But apparently there was a rumor that some users had the access to buy a pro version. And um, like a couple of days ago, so three days ago, there was a Verge article where some users really uh, recorded video that in the menu, they could purchase a pro version. I don't have it available at the moment, but there is proof that is available uh, in video format. We that... have signed up for it, but we haven't gotten the access yet. Uh, if we've gotten the access, maybe we would have faster responses, but okay, uh, let, let's just wait for it. And we were we are happy to pay here at our company. We're happy to pay the $42 a month for all the value that we get from it. Especially, I've been using it a lot. And if it saves me like one hour a week, I think it's more by now. Yeah, that doesn't add up uh, with the cost that uh, it brings uh, because it's an amazing tool not to copy paste, but to give you as an uh, inspiration. Okay, so let's move over to another domain, an extremely exciting, exciting domain in the area uh, of um, generative AI. And that is everything related to image and video. 
So generative models are used for different tasks. Uh, for example, image synthesis. So uh, given a text or an image, uh, creates something completely new. Having very old and rusty images that, uh, that are very low resolution to do like a super res resolution uh, model on it, just like you would see in like CSI uh, movies and also image to image translation and so on. But what better way again than to show you a tool that does it. This is a, a popular one. We will show some a little, uh, little bit uh, uh, less popular later on. But Dolly, again, by this company, research company, OpenAI, is uh, a model that um, does this uh, image, uh, sorry, image generation with generative uh, AI. So very simply put, you give it a prompt, just like you would give chat GPT, and it would create an image for you. Maybe a little fun fact. Writing these prompts to generate cool images uh, is a little bit of an art form, but you can always ask ChatGPT, write for me the best prompt to create an avocado car uh, that I can give to Dolly, and then uh, it, it gives you the best prompt to do it. So that is a fun way to do it, but let's now try it like this. So maybe a um, good idea. Yes, so this is Dolly again in a web browser. I'm logged in with my OpenAI account and I can give here a prompt. I don't know if, if if we have a good idea. We're from raccoons. Maybe we have to do something with raccoons. Let's, so uh, 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 a raccoon exploring the metaverse. Um, uh, I'm uh, used to uh, um, riding raccoons. Uh, a raccoon exploring the metaverse um, in a forest. Yeah. Um, okay. Let's say digital art or yeah. something like that. It's always a cool form. And see what it generates for me. And again, this is using a, um, what we call a, um, a uh, diffusion model. Uh, so it's started with random noise and it's generating these images. And here we have a raccoon exploring the metaverse. Okay, so it's not really, I, I don't really see the metaverse in it. If you want, uh, maybe, maybe with a VR. Uh, let's make it creepy with a VR. Oh. Yeah, a VR escape. Okay, you so, do it. Yeah, try this here. Okay, with a VR headset. Yeah. Yes, headset. Like this. Yeah. And again, and this again, is the art of prompt engineering and uh, trying to configure it a little bit to get a cool output. But the images that it's that they are they're shown here are non-existing. So it's not that like that it found a specific image. It really generated a custom image for me based on. The models that Michiel explained before. Yes. So this is, I think, exactly what uh, what we want. <laughs> yes, and it's very cool that you also can not not only give the prompt but also the style. So digital art is here one uh, one. Um, this is the coolest one. Yeah, this is the best one, I guess. Uh, digital art is one type of style that you can give it. But let's say three uh, D model art or something like that, and. In the best case, uh, where we will get uh, a, another um, response. Um, the thing, by the way, about Dolly is that this is a paid service. It's a little bit, yeah, it's a little bit more three D, um, uh, but Picasso it, style. Picasso style maybe. I'm terrible at your keyboard. Um, but this is a paid service from OpenAI, so you have to buy credits to use um, this service. Um, and those credits are not very expensive, but it's something that you, you yeah, yeah, yeah you, it, it should be noted that this is not free. Like, um, is this Picasso? Oh, Picasso is bad years maybe. Yeah. Um, but okay, so that, that, that's very nice. You get some free credits every month. So if you don't use it too often, it's, it stays completely free. But this is one of the things that OpenAI is trying to do to monetize their uh, research and monetize their systems. Um, and it's, 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 it's very nice. We have used it for a lot of, uh, for, for, to create a lot of content uh, for presentations, for blogs, for our website, social media posts, and so on. Uh, white paper, which we'll mention later, is all uh, used with Dali or some uh, brothers or sisters of Dali. Even our Christmas card this year that we sent to our customers was built by uh, uh, Dali. But maybe also important to state, uh, referring back to the Microsoft investment, these tools are currently, we do them via the web interface, expect them to be integrated into Microsoft Azure. So as a developer, you can very easily integrate them into existing applications uh, later on. 
But you so, can also use the API if you want. Yeah, yeah. At the moment, you can use the API, uh, but then again, it will be more like plug and play into Azure, also using your uh, Azure company billing account and so on, yes. so completely into the Microsoft ecosystem. And not all OpenAI systems or other systems do have an API. For example, ChatGPT does not have a public API exposed that we can use as a developer. However, GPT-3, the model, or GPT-3.5, the model behind ChatGPT does have an API. So it really depends a little bit on the use case and the stuff you want to do, if you can easily integrate it into your applications or not. Okay, let's step away from OpenAI. This is a, another uh, text-to-image diffusion model called Stable Diffusion. That's a quite the obvious name. Uh, this is not has nothing to do with OpenAI, but again, a very powerful generative AI text to image. The company so behind this is uh, called Stability AI. And um, what's very nice about Stable Diffusion is in comparison to DALI is that this is open source. Yeah. Uh, so you can use it, you can alter it, you can make it better, you can add your domain knowledge to it. So you can basically do whatever you want to it. Um, and um, they have an online demo that we uh, would like to show you now. Um, uh, let me see here. So this is the stable diffusion. They have an online demo. And there is, um, let's see if I can click, because there are a lot of Zoom bars. Okay. Maybe I can just yeah, remove this. Um, okay. Here is the demo, the online demo, but you can also, yeah, deploy this on your own servers you can there is even a um, um there is even a mac app um, where you can just that just incorporates the model and then it runs completely locally on your device um which does take a while even with the latest uh, macs um but um yeah it's 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 very nice that that that, that this is an open source model that people can use and it can make, make changes on this so this is what uh, stable diffusion does um, and there's like sitting on a VR headset. So yeah. that's quite, uh, that's quite creative. Yeah. So again, it, it's an image, it's a text to image uh, system that we can use uh, like this. So something else than, um, than Dolly, uh, more open source stability AI, but also it, it got a big funding this year um, because um, they're doing a lot of yeah, powerful and good research uh, in this space of, uh, of image generation and generative AI in general. All right, um, let's just head to the next one then. No, this is it. Yeah, so the next one is a pretty cool one. I really wanted to add it to the presentation because it's a tool built on top of different models. So on the one hand, it uses GPT-3, uh, GPT-3.5 that we've seen by OpenAI, but it also uses stable diffusion. And the best way to explain what it does is imagine Photoshop on steroids. So for example, if I would have an image of Elon Musk, and I want him to wear a suit because he was wearing like casual a shirt and a trousers. That would take me quite some time to do this in uh, uh, in uh, uh, in Photoshop. This is using uh, instruct pix to pix. So we gave him an image of Elon Musk wearing quite a casual outfit. Uh, you can see here that he's wearing like a shirt. And then I just said, uh, make him wear a suit. And it a little bit messes with the face. Uh, so it's not 100% perfect. But as you can see, it, like it put a complete suit on him without having to do any photoshopping work. The only thing uh, I did is make him wear a suit. And maybe, I don't know if I can uh, end a um, uh, uh, mustache. Let's see, what it, uh, let's see what it does. So I can now just generate it. This takes a little bit more time, 81 seconds. I will come back to it later in the presentation. What I also think is very interesting about this is that we, we inputted this image with a lot of logos of HP and Sundance yeah. Festival. And what we saw in the new generated images was that all those logos logos were messed up. So, so they're not really readable anymore. And this is also one of the problems with these image generation tools is they're not very good yet with text. Um, and but there, this is the next part of the research to make it better with text. So you can say, for example, generate an image of a raccoon who holds a little uh, plate or a little board uh, or a little pamphlet with some text on it. And then it can generate, because that is something where these models are very bad at today and something that uh, maybe in the future uh, will get a lot better, which would be nice to, to have li like th these kinds of functionalities added to um, these systems. And now, of course, we still need to wait a little bit. Are we going to come back to this later? We'll come back. If it's, if it's mind-blowing, we'll come back to it in the end of the presentation. All right.
So let's uh, go back to our presentation then. The last one in the category of text to image generation, but it is for me one of the most mind blowing and it's a mid journey. So mid journey is an independent research labs and it is exploring um, text to image generation, uh, but using extremely uh, cool outputs. It is quite often today used for, for example, character design. So designing, for example, characters for games or animation, but also used as input for web design. Um, it ha doesn't have this beautiful web interface, but uh, it uses Discord. So I don't know if people uh, who know Discord compare it a little bit to Teams or Slack for like uh, gaming communities. So that is where it found its, uh, its origin. You have to request access to it, and then you end up into a newbies channel with a lot of other people. So that is a, that is a little bit frustrating that you see other people's content, but you, you can get some pretty cool ideas with that. But um, the complete um, idea is that it's a system that can imagine stuff for you. So you can say imagine, and then say, for example, again, a raccoon, a raccoon in a forest wearing a VR headset, but now make it pretty cool, Viking style. Oh, Viking style and medieval. Eh? So uh, I, I probably you get the style that I want to generate. And then um, you can start, uh, It will uh, you have to wait before you start, but I will try to um, scroll back so that the other user's content doesn't come in there because it's, you really see it generating. You can see it in this post here. This is, uh, is mine, ah, this is our first version. And now as you get the diffusion model. You see a diffusion model doing its work here and that's very nice. So now we're a step further. We're all, only at 31%, but it's already a raccoon with a VR headset, 62%. And it gets better and better and at 100% we get a very nice uh, uh, image of, uh, of this raccoon. Oh, I really start to like this one. But as you can see, oh, damn it, other users with their, now with their irrelevant the content. Bottom. Ah, it's done, okay. Yes, it's done. Yeah, so it you can see here, I will, oh, I will try to open it. Yes. These are extremely cool. Like, uh, look at this VR headset, which turned into something medieval or this one. So really cool images. So as you can see, it's used super often nowadays for ideas for game design, but also for web design. Uh, um, for example, uh, we won't wait for this, or maybe we'll, uh, a landing page, page design, UX, UI, some buzzwords uh, for IT works, which uh, is a platform for uh, tech talks. Let's do it like this. Sorry, uh, Patrick, this isn't probably uh, <laughs> the best tagline for IT works, but uh, it uh, will show you how it can also, uh, this person Benitez is also doing this, is used for generate uh, designs. Again, absolutely not for copy pasting, but perfect to generate ideas. Again, you can see the diffusion model uh, trying to um, improve it. So it's 31%. Yeah. Patrick, I think, uh, Patrick, I think you can uh, uh, use these ideas maybe uh, for a, a new design uh, based on mid journey. I think that will be quite the marketing bus. Yeah. And again, what you see here is that it's not good with text. And that's always the case. Mm -hmm. uh, let's go to the bottom. It's, it's, it's like generating uh, random text, but it's yeah, so cool. And you see a speaker here and some technology stuff there. So it, it might be. A, good for generating ideas and you can like uh, um, ask for variants on certain designs and so on. Yeah. Also the, the whole concept of prompt engineering is something that's very important with uh, Midjourney because there are some specific commands that you can give to Midjourney like fixed commands, not uh, natural language, but like fixed commands. For example, uh, dash dash stylize 700, which is a command that you can give feed to the model to yeah make it do more stuff for you. You can say focus on some words in my sentence more than on other words. So this this whole concept of prompt engineering is is is, is something that's very um, yeah present in 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 the in the uh, mid journey generative AI tool. In the yeah. online freelance market where you can hire freelancers remotely, there are a lot of prompt engineering and engineers who will help you. But of course, you can always ask ChatGPT to write the best prompt for you for mid journey, and it will help you with that. That's true. Um, Patrick wanted to say something? Yeah, there's a question uh, because we're doing this talk in English. You also put the prompts in in English, but oh. it's of course obvious that we can also talk Dutch to this, probably uh, French as well. I've never tried it, but Spanish mm -hmm. as well. It yeah. understands different languages, at least ChatGPT does. Huh. 
Yeah, we can maybe we can try it. Um, but the, the, the thing is, it, it really depends on the language model that is used behind this. Um, most of these language models are pretty uh, language independent. They have read a lot of languages and it doesn't really matter in which language you do it, but it depends on the model that is used. And no, it has read a lot of um, more uh, English content than Dutch content. So don't expect it to be as good in uh, Dutch as in English, but let's see what it does now. We have we have Wasbeer in a bus with a VR headset. Let's see what it's creating. No. So the Wasbeer is something, so the raccoon is something that it didn't really understand. So I guess Mid Journey, uh, especially Mid Journey, didn't doesn't really use a um, a VR uh, a multilingual language model. It did understand bus, so the forest. Uh, and the VR headset, which is just an English word, but okay. Uh, but the Wasbeer is something that it didn't uh, understand here. So that's that's again, something to, to note. He uh, thought that he needed to generate like a person or something like that, but you just need to look at the details and the accuracy of the generation of this. You can generate extremely, extremely accurate people with it. So for example, you see a lot of uh, company websites and they use like these stock images of people. Stop doing that and generate your stock images on Midjourney. It's super impressive what the accuracy of these models are. The, the four U's you see here are to upscale those images. So U1 is for this, two, three, and four. So now I asked it to upscale uh, the fourth image, and then you get a, a, a super high resolution version of this, which is it's, it's very nice. Right? You can indeed use it on your website, on social media posts, on in presentations. You can use these images, and it's it's, it's something that's very nice. Yeah. Uh, where we are with copyright is something that we will uh, discuss a little bit later. Yeah. Okay. I don't know if the upscaled version is here yet. No, I think it's. Uh... Uh, lot, uh, so other people generating raccoons. I think we inspired them. Yes, indeed. Uh, the upscaled version takes some time. It's got it, of course, as you can imagine. Uh, you get some free credits, but it consumes a lot yeah. of computing power. So we are at the back of the queue. But when we're finished, we're going to send it over, uh, this random person in a forest. But uh, uh, just to show you what the quality is. OK, so let's step away from text to image and stay a little bit in the image and video domain, but uh, make a, a hop to video. Because uh, a lot of people are also experimenting with something that is even more complex, and which, which is the text to video. So given a text input, it can generate videos. And there is uh, all these AI tools have very descriptive naming. So there is a, a tool or a model that's called make a video. Uh, it, it, it's quite, it says it all. Uh, we can show it a little bit uh, with some uh, demos that they have available uh, on their website. Um, normally you can see it now. Oh, yeah, no, it sorry. will come, sorry. it will come. I'm still switching. So this is the, the, the landing page of Meta. So Meta, the company behind Facebook is one of, is a creator of make a video. And at this point, this is still a very, research phase so you can see it can generate some very small not high resolution uh, videos here is a teddy bear painting a portrait and you see here uh, that is doing so a robot dancing in times square again it's it's at this point i i would say it's like some kind of G uh, uh, gifs or gifs or in yeah. like you see in giphy um it's it's more for those uh, kind of content uh, stuff but yeah, imagine this getting better over time. Imagine you have a, a product, for example, you're the creator of a new backpack and you have some images of the backpack. You give it to the model. You say, now uh, 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 make someone wear this backpack on a bike, uh, on a nice road in San Francisco or something like that. And it will generate an image for you. And you have all your marketing material just uh, with, with a few clicks. This is something that I think is very nice if this uh, is, 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 is something that is uh, possible in the future. And maybe again, important to state, you see a lot of these uh, even mobile apps that where you can take a picture and then it, or an old image of, for example, your um, deceased grandparents and you can make them come to life a little bit. So it's given an image. This is given text, horse, drinking water, realistic. And this is the output. So. It's just to state how insane this is. This isn't an existing image, an existing video or whatever. It started with this prompt and then that video came to be. But Meta needs to pump a little bit more money into this and a little bit less into the Metaverse. <laughs> and then we're gonna see some more uh, advancement, uh, advancements in this space. All right. All right.
Then uh, something that is quite often forgotten, but um, he and I are both musicians, so we are extremely excited about this domain in generative AI as well, because um, uh, music generation or music style transfer is also becoming more and more popular. And more and more tools are coming to the market. Let's call it the market again. And Refusion uh, is one of these uh, uh, cool tools to show. So again, a diffusion model, uh, but it works in a quite unique way that you wouldn't really expect, Hugh. Yes, so it actually uses stable diffusion. So an image generation tool, but it um, it's uh, generating, I want to say, Mel's spectrograms yep. uh, um, like uh, to, to uh, which can be translated into an audio song um, 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 uh, as you can see here and it's basically the same thing the nice thing about this is on refusion.com you can just enter your prompt I forgot one thing uh, Patrick I need to share my audio as well so I'm going to click share audio and share my screen again and see if this works now. And Zoom is doing a little bit difficult for this. Let's see. We can't hear you anymore. into uh, a song. Are you ready for this? <laughs> we have no idea what will come up. We, we won't say that this is the best music you've ever heard, <laughs> but this, this is a research phase. And I think it's pretty cool that there is a, uh, that there is some research there and we're having some advancements there. Sometimes the server also just like uh, ChatGPT is a little bit lagging behind. Uh, Blue song with a saxophone solo up tempo. No idea. Again, quite this nice. sounds it's quite nice, but if it's I, still very robotic. If I was in a bar in New York and this was playing, I wouldn't ask any questions. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Um, this is generating straight audio, but also there, there can be systems that are not generating audio, but are generating, for example, just music scores, sheet music, music notes that are not uh, that are not audio, but that musicians can read and play. And for example, I think it was the 10th Symphony of Beethoven, which was um, um, yeah, generated or was finished by an AI system. So there were some some extra um, uh, uh, yeah music that was written by an AI system. It learned the style of Beethoven and it wrote some stuff, and then it was played by a, 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 a symfo symphony orchestra. I, I think you say it like that in uh, in English. Um, and um, so that's also a possibility where the AI is generating the. The, the notes, but it's the, the the performance of the music is still human. Uh, I, I think also in music, there uh, you, you can just let the the, the, lyr the lyrics be generated, for example, by uh, Chat GPT, by Chat GPT. The album cover by Midjourney and the music by Refusion, and you can start a band with no music skills. So yes. again, if someone <laughs> has the idea for uh, starting an AI band, we're up for it. Okay, so that is the, the, the music space, which I, I think it's also pretty interesting to, to see what's happening there. In 2020, the Eurovision um, Song Contest was in the Netherlands, and in parallel of the, of the, uh, the general, the regular Eurovision, there was an AI based Eurovision Song Contest where, where, where a, a, a contestants could, um, yeah, could introduce um, AI generated music. Um, I, I, we don't have an example of, of the winner of that uh, contest, but if you Google it, you will surely find uh, the winner of this, um, this AI uh, song contest, which is very nice because 2020, maybe if there are now some new song contests, it would be even better than that. Okay. All right. And then the last domain, so we had text, we had images and video, we had music, is coding. We already showed some capabilities of, for example, chat GPT, where you can ask questions about code, let it generate code, and then perhaps copy paste it. But again, developers um, recently got access to GitHub Copilot, 
and what GitHub Copilot does is gener sorry, generating or suggesting code. For example, when you start programming, you can use uh, GitHub Copilot, which Michiel will show later on, to complete your code, to give suggestions and so on. So it's AI and human developers working together to create the best code, and again, in the fastest manner possible. I think we'll, uh, we're already an hour in, so maybe we can skip this demo because we already saw some okay. code generation. Know that this is a plugin into your text editor and coding tool, so you can just plug it in and it will live there in your uh, coding uh, tool. And there it will, yeah, read your code and suggest some so, some more yeah. stuff to it can write, which is very nice. But maybe we we saw, already saw something like this in ChatGPT. Yeah. So um, because we're running Good out. Good idea. Of Okay, so let's go to the next session. These were some general use cases in text, video, music, uh, coding, uh, and so on, uh, and uh, images. Um, let's see how you can use this generative AI in uh, your business. And um, what I always say when, when, I, when I get this question is every scenario where you have to create content in your professional life and content as we saw it can be a very broad range of content it can be images it can be text it can be audio it can be content for your website images text it can be social media posts mailing templates as i mentioned the cold emails blog posts code images everything where you can create content generative ai um, can help you. Now, th there's one thing that, that you should always um, note there is that this is an assistive tool. It's something to help you be more efficient, something that helps you if you uh, if you're feeling, for example, a little bit less creative. The thing is that you cannot copy paste this sometimes because it's just wrong, sometimes because it's just very general and it's not like too detailed. Um, but it's something that you can use in in those content creation, and it's this is very a very broad range of use cases. I, I think JetGPT was was set live without a a real use case. There is just we're going to put it online for free on the internet, and we're going to see how people are using it. And you see that people are using it in in, in a broad range of domains, uh, as we mentioned before. Um, how do you, how have we used it in our company? We use it to help us. For example, when we're writing proposals, uh, when we need to find challenges for a certain research topic, when we need to explain a technology in a, in a proposal, when we need to explain technology in presentation, when we need to create uh, images for presentations, when we need to create images for white papers, which we'll mention later as well. Um, all those kinds of things, even I think Sam already mentioned it, but our Christmas card this year or at the end of last year was completely AI generated as uh, the, 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 the picture on it. And also the text on it was all AI generated. And of course we created like, I think 100 uh, Christmas cards images and we just uh, humanly picked the best one. So it's not fully automated. It's not fully AI, but we just, uh, uh, yeah, played around with different prompts, different stuff we tried to generate, and then we just used the best one to complete a human pick. So it made us be more efficient. We didn't need to hire, yeah, like a, a 3D designer or or or, or, or um, yeah, a, a painter, a, a drawing uh, specialist. Uh, we just used the uh, dolly, and then we picked the best image, and we could just pick it, uh, um, yeah, humanly ourselves. Um, what it can also do is it can help for inspiration about a new product, for example, new product designs or new product pitches. And um, just to test this, we, we especially uh, 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 or specifically for this presentation, we asked a generative AI model to create a prototype of a uh, avocado shaped car and not just a prototype, but also the name, the tagline, the USPs. And what is an avocado car? It's just a, a, a fun idea. It's not something that is a good idea or something that exists today or that should exist. It's just, let's say, if we want to make an avocado car in the shape of an avocado that runs on avocado oil, and I need a name for it, I need a prototype for it, I need a landing page for it, I need a tagline for it, and I need USPs for it. And what did we do? We just um, uh, used um, uh, generative AI 
to do all those things. And this was the result. So we have the name, the Guacmobile. Uh, we have the tagline, mesh up the road, the, the road in style. And then we have um, a, a few uh, USPs. Um, for example, it's a sustainable fuel source. So avocado oil is a sustainable fuel source. We know this is not, uh, this is not uh, right or not correct, uh, but this is just something that it's helpful for the pitch. It has low emissions, cost effectiveness, so unique design and innovative technology. And then it also generated some context, uh, some content for each of these USBs. And on the left, you see a prototype or a drawing of what this car, car might look like. I think it's pretty cool. Um, it, 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 if I, this is just a fun example, of course, but if you want to create an investor pitch and you need some designs, you need some content, you need maybe a good name, yeah, it it can it it can be a good inspiration. And again, don't copy paste it, but use this as an inspiration. And here we have a, a good idea. If someone wants to build an avocado car that runs on avocado oil, you can yeah just steal this idea. We didn't even generate it ourselves. It's all ChatGPT. Um, it's uh, um, and mid journey indeed. All right. Um, so that's how you can use it in your business. But um, some of the questions we get a lot is is can you incorporate your own custom business logic, your own custom domain knowledge into, into those generative AI models. And the answer is not that simple because it really depends. If the AI model you want to use or you want to change is closed source, you cannot really change anything about those models. And uh, one of the uh, um, examples is, for example, G GPT-3 or GPT-3.5, uh, which runs uh, ChatGPT. Also, DALI is one of those models that is closed source, and you cannot really change anything about it. Now, there are other models that are open source. For example, Stable Diffusion or GPT-2 are models that are op open source. And there, you can uh, download the model and you can change the model. But there is one problem. Those models are often very big on themselves. So what, what you need to make even the slightest changes with your own custom uh, business logic, uh, you need a lot of data to, to, to see that, 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 it, that it affects the model and it actually changes to your business logic. So know that even there, there is an, yeah, a big but that you, you, need, um, you need a lot of, uh, of data there. But something that you can do is um, you can add some custom technology on top or of or around the model. So, for example, we created a chatbot in what we call our Oswald chatbot platform, which is it, it uses more like the the, the classic chatbot technology with uh, where, the, the, where it detects an intent and it gives a predefined answer and we have this control over the scenario. So it's just not a language generation technology, but it's more, more like the classic chatbot technology. Um, but when there is no predefined answer, we just offload it to ChatGPT. And that's just a small demo that we built where we have the OSWALT platform and ChatGPT, or it's not really ChatGPT, it's basically GPT 3.5, but it's like the, 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 the fuel of ChatGPT. Um, and we wanted to show you that today just to see how you can combine your own, um, where it is, your own, um, uh, yeah, uh, business logic in the more classical um, Chabble technology, but you can also offload, if there is no predefined answer, we can offload it to ChatGPT. So um, here is what the Chabot looks like. It's in Dutch, but I will translate it on the go. So it says, um, I don't know why it says, I I want I need to uh, refresh this. Let's see if it works now. Okay, so it says hello. What's your name? I say in heel. There's no language generation, no GPT behind this. I say, for example, I cannot log in on my account. Made he, a little typo he there. A, he has a special skill to speak in English and okay. write in Dutch. I challenge you all to do this <laughs> after his presentation. It is quite difficult. It's pretty difficult, yes. I made a typo here. It doesn't really matter. It recognized my um, uh, my input and it says, okay, I'm sorry to hear you cannot log into your account. Michiel, it rem remember my name. It asked me a question. Do you know your username? I say, uh, yeah, the Kenik. Yes, I know. I know my username. Okay, then you probably forgot your password. If you forgot your password, click here. And it gives you some instructions, all just 
fixed scenario that I programmed into this shovel. There is no language generation whatsoever happening here. Specifically for this company. Yeah? So it's uh, specifically, for example, uh, let's imagine Thalenet. I can't log into my Thalenet account. It does it for you. For yes. So this is all custom knowledge for this company, domain knowledge for this company. But now I say, for example, what's your favorite holiday? Okay, we didn't foresee that, that users would ask this. So what do we do now? Okay, we just offload it to uh, GPT and we get a reply. For example, my favorite holiday is Christmas. I love the coziness and, uh, and, and being together with my friends and family. And it's a time to enjoy good food, presents, uh, and, um, and, and, and have some special memories there. And now I, I can just uh, ask some more questions. Uh, uh, for example, how do you think about that? Okay. Again, users, questions. Yeah, users wouldn't ask this, it's more of a philosophical question. We, 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 we don't want to have a predefined response for all these things. But again, we're sending this to GPT and we get a reply. I think that is a, an in, inevitable part of, the, of life. And again, we get some uh, content there. So I think this, this is a very nice uh, way to have those technologies work together. We have the fixed responses. If I now say, for example, um, um, I forgot my, my passwords. Again, it goes to the original predefined answer. And now there's no language generation. This is something that I control, something that I predefined, something that I programmed the chatbot to do, but only for those other questions, we have an offload to GPT, where you see those two technologies working together quite nicely. And now you get an almost unbreakable chatbot, which yes. is a pretty cool experience. So if you want to learn more about this, as Michiel mentioned, Ozolk is a chatbot platform, which is a product of uh, Raccoons, where we, which we use at Acerta, Elon, uh, and so on. Uh, if you want to learn more about what we're doing today with GPT uh, in Oswald, feel free to reach out via an email and uh, we'll discuss what's possible more in depth. But for this presentation, we'll leave it at that. Michiel and I think a lot of people have a lot of questions about the legal part. Yes, and we have we had a lot of questions about this as well. And um, we're not ju jurists, we're not lawyers. No. We, we don't know a lot about this. So what we, did, we do is we called, uh, we scheduled a one hour call, call with someone who is specialized in this theory, uh, 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 a lawyer basically. Um, and we asked him some questions. Eh? For example, the main question that we asked here is who owns the intellectual property? Is it, and th there are three candidates who might be able to claim the intellectual property of the stuff that generative AI is generating. It can be the creator of the prompt. So when the person who asks the question to, gener to generate content, it can be the creator of the algorithm or it can be maybe the algorithm itself. Now today, no one of these parties, uh, according to this lawyer, can claim intellectual property because no one created anything. So they create, or, or no one created the content that we want to claim the intellectual property on. So the creator of the prompt, they created the prompt, but they didn't create, for example, the image. The creator of the algorithm, again, they, they created the algorithm, but again, they didn't create the actual image. And the algorithm itself, it, it created the actual image. So that would be a very good candidate to claim the intellectual property. The problem is, at this point, algorithms cannot claim intellectual property. It has to be a natural person who can then maybe uh, transfer their rights to a company. But that's it. So uh, algorithm cannot claim intellectual property, even that that is that is the thing that created it. So this is this is a problem. Um, today this is a problem. Um, and for example, if we say the algorithm itself is maybe the best candidate, but there is some problem there as well because the algorithm can produce lots of content just randomly. For example, the algorithm can uh, produce millions and millions of logos every day, and that for the coming ten years. Now, and if it, if it can claim IP, it can claim IP on all the millions or even billions of logos it's generated. So if someone else produces something similar, a similar logo, the other party or the algorithm that has the IP 
um, it's, uh, already has the IP, I'm sorry. So no one will ever be able to create a logo again because the algorithm created so many logos and so many different logos and claimed IP on all of those that there is still a problem there. So this is one of the problems that if you say the algorithm should claim IP, yeah, it can produce a lot more content than a human can do. So is it maybe then the creator of the prompt? Uh, maybe is it the creator of the algorithm? There are some problems there as well. I think, yeah, we, we need to think about this and the legislation is not there yet. Um, I think some of those um, uh, uh, um, uh, creators of generative AI tools, they, they don't allow you to use those images in, uh, for example, in commercial content or in books, but normally they're not allowed to, to, yeah, to disallow you to do this or to restrict, to, to restrict you to do this because they cannot claim IP as well. So this is a problem uh, right now. If you use a generative AI algorithm, um, just say you didn't use the algorithm and you just created it yourself, then that, that, that's like to bypass all this legislation and then you can claim IP. Okay, I see we have 13 minutes left and we want to leave some space for questions. So we have uh, some other parts as well, but we'll go over that a little bit faster. Again, if you want more details, uh, feel free to reach out and we'll... Uh, uh, gladly explain them more in depth. But of course, next to the legal uh, issues, a lot of ethical questions uh, arise as well. We try to categorize a little bit into different uh, different areas, but of course, bias is a major problem. As mentioned, these models are trained on massive amounts of data, example given Wikipedia, Reddit, and so on. As you can ima imagine, these uh, sources contain a lot of biases, racial biases, sexist biases, and so on. And these are all fed to these models again. So. Uh, despite the fact that the creators obviously don't want this, this occurs quite often and it could lead to unfair outcomes. Also transparencies, yeah, for the majority of these, these AI models are of course quite black boxes. You don't know the original sources. Uh, these models are also super confident. Uh, for example, avocado oil is a sustainable source, not really true, but ChatGPT says it that confident, that uh, very untransparent how it came to be, that there is some skepticism around that as well. Also privacy. Uh, imagine a model that is trained on everything on the internet. Yeah, on the internet, there is a lot of sensitive and private information about individuals that can be misused and mishandled and extracted uh, by writing the right prompts, which is, of course, uh, quite uh, potentially harming. Also, control. Michiel mentioned creating designs. For example, what if I create designs that are uh, that are similar to already existing content and so on? No one has control over that. Then safety and security, a major topic, maybe in the next session, uh, Patrick, we can go into much more detail there as well. But um, in a security perspective, generative AI also causes a, a, a huge risk. Why? Generative AI is extremely good at writing phishing mails. The era of, uh, what is it, uh, the, the uh, Brazilian princess, for example, that uh, left you a heritage. Uh, these phishing mails uh, are long in the past. Today, we have generative AI that can create amazing phishing mails that are super realistic and will harm a lot of people, which is, of course, a terrible thing. But also writing malware, giving you designs to create weapons and so on. Um, with the people at OpenAI, for example, are creating these barriers that you can't ask questions, but there are ways around that. I've re uh, read uh, tens of blogs about people writing super specific malware to write viruses and so on. And then the last one, uh, I think the most prominent and the most asked question, will my job be replaced? If you do a super repetitive job um, where you need to create content and so on, generative AI will become better at that. But again, today, it's more assisting to the humans, but what will time bring? So generative AI really does pose a threat there as well. And then to head up uh, to the last, uh, the, the, the second to last section of yes. limitations and just, considerations. Just two small sections. Um, what are some limitations and some co considerations um, that you need to think about when you're using or incorporating generative AI in your uh, in your business? Is that, yeah, we already mentioned it. Generative AI can be wrong. It, it, it doesn't always have a fact checking stuff uh, behind it. For example, ChatGPT is just a language generation model. It doesn't fact its own things and it can say that avocado oil is the best fuel source of course the bias stuff as some already mentioned that there is a lot of bias in on the internet so we should you should think about that when you're using it 
also you have to use the right tool for the right reason. So don't use generative AI just to use it, but find the right reason and incorporate it into your workflow. And what we also advise is to call on experts to ensure it will truly help your business. And it also gets integrated in your workflows because then you, you will get the most uh, gain from, from generative AI algorithms. Of course, IP rights are still somewhat in the middle. Um, Something else that, it's, that we haven't uh, mentioned today, uh, but is the sustainability part. Those models, uh, they, they use a lot of computing power and therefore a lot of energy. And we need to think in the future about how can we reduce this? How can we use, for example, more green energy to train these models? When do we train these models? Maybe we, we, we uh, or and where do we train these models? For example, when the sun is shining and, and, and those uh, systems are fueled by solar panels, then we should train them and not at night, for example. And also where and, wh where and when, on which data centers do we use them? Um, um, th those are things that we need to think about uh, when we're using more and more of these um, um, generative AI systems. Always put a human in the loop. Uh, we, we mentioned it a lot of times. Don't copy paste blindly. Think of it as an assistant, something that helps you when you're not creative, something that makes you more efficient, but it's not a replacement, at least not for now. And uh, something that we haven't mentioned today as well is that these models are often trained on historic data. For example, ChatGPT is just trained on stuff until 2021. So if you ask it who, uh, who won the World Cup uh, football, it will say France. Um, because they won the World Cup football in 2018. Okay, and finally, what will the future bring? So um, uh, we think there is a bright future ahead for generative artificial uh, intelligence, and maybe we will think back about this time that we're in, and we see, okay, this was an iPhone moment, maybe not, uh, well, we made some kind of estimated guess what the future will bring. And one of the things is there will be newer and better models. Um, OpenAI already said that they will probably in 2023 release GPT-4, the next generation of language generation, uh, of their language generation model. And of course, yeah, it will be better than GPT-3. Now, there's a lot of hype around this and the CEO of OpenAI uh, already tried to manage the expectations uh, there. They say that people will be disappointed. They're begging to be disappointment, uh, disappointed and they will be because it, it will be better, but it won't be like extremely groundbreaking uh, when we compare to GPT-3. Uh, um, but again, it's an advancement and we will see newer and better models there. We think there will be more legacy legislation and that's legislation around content policies, eh? for example, all the mal malware and stuff, uh, pornographic content and all those things, but also content policy, uh, but also uh, intellectual property. We think that we will see this in the next years, some more legislation around that as well. There is one company um, that we haven't mentioned today, and that is Google. And of course, Google is doing a lot of stuff in a generative AI space. Why haven't we mentioned it? Because it hasn't uh, been made available to the general public. Uh, Google is a little bit, little bit more hesitant because they have a reputation to, to, um, to, uh, to, to manage there. They don't want to give uh, fake content uh, of an AI model or a generative text model like, like ChatGPT. Uh, if, if, if they're not 100% sure that it's that it's not producing uh, wrong content or biased content. So they, they have a reputation to manage there, but they have their own systems and they will probably um, demo their version of ChatGPT on Google I.O. Uh, at Google, it's called Lambda, their, their language model. Um, and there, we know that they're already testing this internally. We've seen it on the news and stuff like that, but it's not to the general public. We don't know if Google will release it to the general public in 2023, but that might be a possibility just to make like a, an inhal maneuver and um, yeah, a catch up to, uh, to OpenAI. Um, of course, we will see these systems also be integrated into cloud platforms. We already mentioned Microsoft Azure incorporating all the open AI stuff. And I, I think there will be some versions of stable diffusion, for example, in Google Cloud or in Amazon Web Services or, or, or the, those things. And something that's very um, interesting is that now they're all separate tools, but we think they will be integrated into the tools we use every day. 
uh, we already see that notion uh, the, that's it's documentation software basically it's all where you can write text and all those kind of things and pages for documenting meetings and documenting software and all those things um, they're already integrating GPT, the language model, into their um, system, which is very interesting because it's a real application, it's a real use case of generative AI, um, Yeah, making you more efficient, not next to your other tools, but in the tools that you're using today. Imagine that ChatGPT or GPT 3.5 or maybe GPT 4 is um, integrated into Microsoft Word. Then you don't need to leave Microsoft Word anymore. It's just a plug in there and you can just type some stuff there and then maybe a new version of Clippy or something will pop up and you can and you can say, okay, just finish this sentence, finish this paragraph for me, or maybe even finish this chapter for me and it will all do this. You can, of course, read it again and maybe uh, alter it a little bit. Maybe in Gmail, if you want to write an email, uh, an integration with ChatGPT. So we think that it will be more yeah, more common to see those things, not as separate tools that we need to remember the names and we, and we need to go to our browser and have an account there, but more have it integrated in the tools we already use. All right, and finally, um, yeah, this already uh, says what we think about the link to artificial general intelligence. We don't think that we're, we're any closer to this because generative AI, a generative AI is still a subset of AI and it's still good and we saw this today in certain specific tasks just like all AI technologies are good in certain tasks eh? we, we started AI in the 90s with playing chess we had uh, some image uh, detection and image labeling now we have just some other stuff that we can do with those things but um, there are still specific tasks specific subsets of AI and we, we don't think that we're closer to what we call general AI, a system that's actually intelligent like humans are. We, we, we don't think that this is like the big breakthrough, um, at least for general AI, but it's something just yeah, to help us um, um, and be more efficient, be more uh, creative in our everyday jobs. And then to wrap up, as we mentioned before, uh, we released uh, last week or this week uh, a white paper, how generative AI will disrupt Belgian businesses, which goes into much more, more detail. Um, we will share the link in the slides, or maybe Patrick, you can send it via email afterwards. Uh, it's already in the chat. So. Ah, perfect. It's free to download, uh, free to share. Uh, it has some more in-depth content. Also follow us on social media. We share a lot of content about generative AI. And we would like to thank you very much for your attention. And I guess there are some questions uh, left, so we will uh, remain here to answer them for you. Thank you very much. Indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so we'll indeed uh, answer the questions, which are a bit more private, maybe after this talk. Uh, I'll stop the recording so that we can. But thank you very much. And you definitely have an interesting story to watch and to see how it evolves. Thank you very much, Sam. Thank you, Michiel.